Good morning, everyone. Come on in, find a seat. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Stuyvesant Mennonite Church. Today is a day that seems to be bursting with activity. Following our service today, we have our annual general meeting. Following that, we have a potluck. Following that, we have a pie auction. It's an exciting day. And to be honest, throughout the week, I kept pushing off this thought of like, oh right, yes, and I also have to plan to lead worship on Sunday. There just seemed to be a lot of things to do. But then as I sat down and I began to prepare, I realized that the act of worship, the experience of worship, the intentional space that we create for worship, that is what reorients us into right relationship with God and with each other. It just helps the other pieces to fall into place. And so I am particularly speaking to the people here this morning that feel like they have a very full plate today when I invite you to take a deep breath, let your shoulders relax, and join me in our call to worship. Jesus calls us. Nope, oh, it's not up yet. One second, everyone. There it is. Okay, we'll try again. Jesus calls us. Jesus calls us to worship. Jesus calls us. Jesus calls us to love. Jesus calls us. Jesus calls us to justice. Let us heed the call of Christ. Let us worship together with joy. Please pray with me. Welcoming God, we come to this place carrying this week's emotions, expectations, and experiences. We lay them down here now as we focus our hearts and our attention on your goodness, your justice, and your amazing love for us and for the rest of your creation. Draw us into worship, we pray. Amen. There should be um, hymnals on the chairs or on the tables. Or find a friend to share with, and there's a few at the back if you'd like another one. Number 22.
Our first scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians, and it is chapter 3, and it is only one verse. It is verse 11. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Christ being that cornerstone, let's sing together number four. Christ is our cornerstone. It is children's time, so kids, you can come on forward and meet Ben up here at the front. Come on up. Good morning. Okay, this Sunday we are starting a new series at our church on Anabaptist history. My first question for you is, do you know what the word Anabaptist means? <clears throat> yes? Okay, let's, let's break down. We got an English lesson here. I'm not an English teacher, but I'm going to pretend to be. If we break the word down, Anabaptist, so the word Baptist or baptism, do you know what a baptism is? Sammy, what's a baptism? Yeah. Right. They pour water on you and say a prayer. That sums it up very nicely. So what, what is baptism about? Why do we get baptized? Or what does it mean when we get baptized? Who, who in our church do we usually see getting baptized? Younger people. Could it be older people too? But not like really young people, like Alita wouldn't be ready to be baptized yet, right? So that's, that's kind of the point. The word Anabaptist, did you know that in some churches they baptize babies when they're born? But Anabaptists believed that maybe there was a better way. They believed that it was better to accept Jesus Christ when you were a little bit older, when you actually understood what it meant to live like Jesus. Now. We're going to hear lots of different stories of Anabaptism. 
Um, and I want to tell you one story today, and it has to do with this. Can you help me get this out? This is a blanket, but it's not just any blanket. I need your help. Can somebody take that corner? Let's spread it out. hold it up as high as we can. Can you guys put your end down so the people out there can see it? There we go. Okay, Claire, can you read what it says there? A double Oma quilt. What's an Oma? Yeah, it's a different way of saying grandma. It's grandma in German. So I have, I had two Omas, I should say. Both of them have unfortunately passed away many years ago. But this quilt has quite a story. Look at all those pieces. I got to tell you a story about my two Omas. I have an Oma Winter and an Oma Dreger. So my dad's mom and my mom's mom. So this, both of them, we can, we can put it down. Both of them came from different parts of the world and they lived through times of war and famine and the, the early parts of their lives were very hard. They didn't have much food. They were fleeing from war, and they both ended up coming to Canada. Now, they came at different times. They didn't know each other, but they both lived a very similar pathway to get here, where their families didn't have much, and they learned that nothing ever goes to waste. They barely had enough food, they barely had enough to put clothes on their back, and so they learned that nothing ever goes to waste. Now, the pieces that this quilt is made of, they would have been little scraps left over maybe from Oma, Oma Winter was the one who started this quilt. And in the 1990s is when we think that she started this quilt. But she would have cut those pieces out of extra cloth that they had lying around. Maybe she had made other blankets or maybe some tablecloths or dresses, but they were little scraps. And most people would have said, nah, it's garbage. What can we use those for? Those little tiny pieces. But she thought, I think we can make something out of this. And she took those pieces and cut out each of those petals of the flowers. Now, my Oma Winter, she unfortunately became ill and was unable to finish the quilt. So those pieces, they got tucked in a closet and forgotten about for probably almost two decades. That's like 20 years, a long time. And then later on, once they sold the house that they had lived in. They had, my Oma and Opa had both passed away and we were going through stuff in the closet and we found all these pieces of flowers that my Oma had cut out many, many years before. My other Oma, Dreger, she said, hey, I have an idea. I'll finish the quilt. And so she did. She finished this quilt and me and Sarah, we got this quilt as a wedding present from my other Oma. So it's a double Oma quilt. Twice the Oma power to make this quilt. Quilts tell stories. And our Anabaptist history is kind of like a quilt. We have lots of people who all play a little part in the story of how our church became the way it is today. So do you have quilts at home? Sometime I want you to ask your parents or your grandparents, where did our quilts come from? See if there's any stories behind your quilts, because I bet some of them have some pretty good stories. And even if they don't have an old, old story like this one, I bet if you look at a quilt, there's hours and hours and hours of time with lots of people that would have worked together, which is a lot like how our church works. It's pretty cool. Why don't we end with a little prayer? Dear God, thank you for the many stories of Anabaptists who showed us the importance of love, peace, and togetherness. Help us be like them, spreading kindness wherever we go and choosing peace instead of anger. Amen. You can go back your seat. Where did you get that? Our new hymn of the uh, month this month is number 749. 
Jesus Christ is love divine. Uh, Susan's going to play just the melody through first. It's not too, too tricky. And then uh, we'll sing our new song together, see how we do. I think it'll be great. stand together and sing. Jesus Christ is love divine, love alive eternally. G measureless in space and time, beyond words a mystery. When we love, we move with Christ. Our second scripture reading today is Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We live in a world of acronyms. Our bulletin is filled with them. AGM, VFT, MEDA, MCEC, MCC, MYF, TGIF, PCRC, CMU, CGUC, AMBS. These little groups of letters are little shortcuts in our speaking and our writing, and they give definition to a group or a concept if you understand the meaning and or the history behind the acronym. Take AMBS, for example. 
Originally, the initials AMBS stood for Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminaries. Associated. Why would it be called Associated? You have to know denominational history to answer that question. About 80 years ago, the two Mennonite denominations each had their own seminary. Mennonite Church, the Swiss background, had Goshen Biblical Seminary in Goshen, Indiana, and the General Conference Mennonite Church, Russian Mennonite background, like Ben was talking about, with Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. Well, in 1954, the leadership of these two seminaries began taking steps toward working together. Each school, they decided they would be on one site, but each school would operate independently, sharing a library, a few joint courses, joint chapel services, joint use of certain facilities, but it was felt that the two denominations' respective constituencies would support this new venture only if the schools remained independent. And hence the name, Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminaries. I attended Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminaries from 1989 to 1993, and my graduation diploma says that I am a graduate of Goshen Biblical Seminary, since my roots are in the Mennonite Church. But the very next year, 1994, the two seminaries officially became one legal entity, and the name changed from Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminaries to Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminary. It took from 1954 to 1994, 40 years, for the two to become one entity. Fascinating history behind one ten-letter word associated. But associated really doesn't mean a whole lot to anybody outside the church and even for us inside the Mennonite church. So in 2011, the Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminary Board proposed a name change that would more clearly define the identity of the school. And the new name that was proposed and adopted was, drum roll please, Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary. You'll note that with this choice of title, the acronym remained the same, AMBS. It's really more with less, isn't it? Anabaptist, a word that rings familiar. It has some connection, no matter what faith heritage has shaped you. And in fact, there is an exploding interest on the part of many people from other denominational backgrounds, young adults especially, in faith from an Anabaptist perspective. In the last several years, leaders from other denominations have urged Anabaptist Mennonites to find ways to promote our expression of faith, to not be so quiet in the land. For they notice our response to natural disasters. They notice our witness to justice and peace issues. They notice the growing interest in spirituality and creation care. You will remember the international attention that the Amish received because of the forgiveness and reconciliation expressed in response to the lives lost at the West Nickel Mines Amish school shooting in 2006. The response of the Amish community to this tragedy, which grew out of their understanding of faith, was radical and it made a big impression. Well, there's also an Anabaptist network that began in Britain and Ireland where Christians from diverse backgrounds are embracing Anabaptist principles. According to their website, not only is the network in the UK, but there are Anabaptist centers in Korea, in Japan, and South Africa. There's an Anabaptist association in Australia and New Zealand and a new Anabaptist network that's emerging in Scandinavia. And none of these nations 
have any historic Anabaptist connections. Anabaptism is clearly of interest. And Anabaptism will celebrate 500 years next year in 2025. So pastors Sarah and Ben and I thought it fitting in this our bicentennial year to consider our broader faith history, to learn more about our roots, our, our faith heritage, to identify and explore the central tenets of our Anabaptist faith. And we do so not to set us apart from other denominations or to make our faith exclusive. We choose to focus on Anabaptists then and now to strengthen our understanding of who we are and how we can best live out our faith. Our worship theme in the months of April and May will focus on a different aspect of Anabaptism. And so this morning, we begin with a brief look into Anabaptist history, for history is not simply about the past. It's about how the past shapes the present and guides our future. To understand where we are now and where we're going requires an understanding of where we have been. And so we begin. The birthplace of the Anabaptist Reformation was in Europe in the 1500s. And several factors converged at one time to create an environment that was ripe for reform. The invention of the printing press came into being a hundred years earlier and Bibles now became available to everyone. Prior to that, Bible stories were told by those who were educated and could read and taught to others through pictures and stained glass windows. Living conditions in the 1400s and early 1500s were very different than we know today in our setting. Travel was harsh, sanitation conditions were poor, illness was prevalent. People didn't live as long. If you survived childhood, you did not live long past 40 years of age. There wouldn't be very many of us. There would be some here today, but many of us wouldn't be here. The church with headquarters in Rome was large and influential. People had no choice of church. You had to practice the faith that your king chose. So change and ferment were in the air, beginning with Martin Luther and other now famous names. There were many reformers that wanted the church to rediscover the good news of Jesus. And the topics being hotly debated were separation of church and state, a mystical relationship with God, better educated priests, and additional moral leaders in the church. Well, it was into this context that several Catholic priests began studying the scriptures and interpreting Jesus' words in new ways. They began preaching the love of one's enemies, a gospel of nonviolence and of freedom for the poor and oppressed. And they came to understand that faith in Jesus was more than hope of eternal life in heaven. Faith in Jesus meant living daily with a, from a Christ-centered point of view. These Catholic reformers believed that belonging to the church was something you should choose. Becoming a Christian because you had committed yourself to Christ and could only make that choice as an adult. So during a time when children were baptized as infants and automatically a citizen of the state, a few priests began rebaptizing adults who were convinced of this radical new expression of faith, thus the name has been suggested, Anabaptists or rebaptizers. We have a short drama to portray the story of the first believers baptisms in Europe. I invite the actors forward at this time.
The year is 1525. Meet three friends in Zurich, Switzerland. Conrad Grable, one of the aristocracy. Felix Mons, a learned scholar of Hebrew. And George K. Jacob, called Blaurock, a straightforward, simple pastor from the town of Kerr. These three friends often met and talked at length on matters of faith, including believers, the baptism of believers. They came to one mind on these things, and in the pure fear of God, they saw that a person must learn from the divine word a true faith which shows itself in a holy Christian life with all godliness. And a person must be steadfast to the end, even in the face of tribulation, danger, and difficulty. On the night of January 21st, 1525, the three friends were together with others in the house of Felix Mons in the city of Zurich. They called this a school. It was a Bible study group. As they read the scriptures, a sense of holy awe came over the whole group and their hearts were moved. They got down on their knees in prayer and they implored God, the one who knew their hearts, help us to do the divine will. Show your mercy toward us. It wasn't human ambition that drove them because they knew very well what they would have to bear and suffer. After the prayer, George, the pastor, got up and asked Conrad, the aristocrat, to baptize him for the sake of God and with true Christian baptism upon his faith and knowledge. George knelt down and Conrad baptized him. After that was done, the others similarly asked George to baptize them, which he did upon their request. And they gave themselves to the name of the Lord in the high fear of God. Each confirmed the other in the service of the gospel, and they began to teach and keep the faith. Anabaptism was born with this group of Christians who emphasized the necessity of a personal commitment to Christ as essential to salvation and a prerequisite to baptism. The introduction of believer's baptism was not an unpremeditated act. Even though its revolutionary character might well have struck the hearts of those assembled on that January night with fear, it was a culmination of earnest searching of the scriptures. Thank you. Well, this newly formed group of Anabaptists said that Christians did not really belong to the kingdoms of this world. They belonged to God's kingdom and that Christ was their ruler and the Bible was their guide for faith and life. And these ideas made the governments of Europe and the state churches angry and frustrated. They wondered how they could run a country or a city if people like the Anabaptists were making their own choices. If people could choose their own church, the next thing you knew, they'd be wanting to choose their own ruler. So the emperor made a law that anyone who was an Anabaptist should be killed as a heretic and as a traitor to the country. It became illegal to be an Anabaptist. Well, as you well know, because of their radical faith commitment, many Anabaptists lost their lives. And we have this book. It's called The Martyr's Mirror, and this is from our church library, and it records the stories of the people who were martyred for their faith. It's a big book. But the threat of death did not stop this faith movement. It spread rapidly to other places around Europe and Russia, and later to North and South America. One of the stories recorded in this book is the story of a young mother of four. Maiken von Devonter wrote a letter to her children from her prison cell in Holland in 1573. In the letter, she told them she could not leave them silver or gold, but what she could leave were instructions that would lead them to eternal riches. 
After calling them to love and follow Christ, she described what it would mean to be a follower of Jesus. She wrote this, My children, love your neighbor heartily, and this with a liberal heart. Let the light of the gospel shine in you. Deal your, your bread to the hungry, clothe the naked, and whatsoever the Lord grants you, that possess with thankfulness, not only for yourselves, but also for your neighbor. And seek not your own profit, but that of your neighbor. In short, my children, let your life be conformed to the gospel of Christ. Soon after that, she was martyred. We, as Anabaptist Mennonites, living in 2024 on this continent, no longer are put to, to death because of what we believe. We are no longer people on the run from government legislation. We are free to worship God and live our faith from an Anabaptist per perspective. Our context has changed greatly from that of the early beginnings of the movement. Cultural shifts have impacted our living. We are now the educated and the wealthy. We live our lives very much intertwined with our present day culture. So what does it mean to live our faith from an Anabaptist perspective in 2024 in southwestern Ontario? What are the distinctives of this expression of faith? These are some of the questions that will be considered in our exploration of Anabaptism in the next couple of months. But one thing that hasn't changed from the very beginning, and that is the starting point of our faith, the central core of our faith, and that is Jesus. We interpret the Bible from a Christ-centered point of view and seek to live every day of life from this vantage point. In other words, our faith, our life is rooted in the life of Christ. And as retar retired Mennonite preacher and teacher Lynn Miller states, Jesus meant what he said, and he's talking to us. The Sermon on the Mount is foundational to our Anabaptist understanding. It was Jesus teaching to the disciples and the crowds of people gathered on the hillside. Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And we heard Janessa read a few verses this morning where Jesus teaches and calls the crowds of that day and what we believe calls us to be salt and light in this world. And from my vantage point, being salt and light includes embracing our own belovedness as a gift from God, and out of that sense of being loved, offering generous blessing, healing, and hope to those we meet, expressed in a whole myriad of ways, standing with others in life through challenges, sharing our resources of time, talent, and treasure, leveling the uneven ground, whether here in this community or around the world. There was a woman who lived through the Holocaust and who remained a strong person of faith, and somebody questioned her about how she could have faith in a God who would let something like the Holocaust happen. Her response was, it wasn't God that let it happen, and it wasn't that God wasn't there but it was that God didn't have enough friends on earth willing to do anything about it. I hear in her words the call of Jesus to be salt and light. Our Anabaptist roots remind us to abide in Christ, that our lives might reflect the gracious and radical love of God in the world. It is an ongoing journey of learning and we don't do it alone. We do so in community. What a wonderful gift. Thanks be to God. You are the salt of the earth. Let's sing that together, number 297. If you would care to join me in standing, feel free or maintain your seat.
As we live into being the salt and the light of the people, as we anticipate our annual general meeting this afternoon, 500 years of Anabaptism and 200 years here at Stein and Mennonite, and reflecting on the past year, the pastors have a few uh, reflections as well as what 2023 was and how we encountered God together. And so, like always, this past year at SMC has been a full one. Full of ministry, life events, celebrations, losses, community events, tireless hours from volunteers, delicious food, and so much more as we strive to grow more and more like Jesus. There's also been a significant number of staff transitions. Since last spring, every office staff has had a major transition or milestone of some form. We said farewell to our beloved accountant, Wendy Wagler, after 15 years. We celebrated and blessed Pastor Steve's retirement after 20 years. We welcomed Pastor Ben we began a new model for shared lead pastoring. We were aided by Sean East's interim accounting work. We welcomed Ashley Drudge into the finance office. In the midst of all of this, Pastor Louise hit one year with us and was the pastor holding so many of these details and transitions together. Just over a week ago, we said farewell to Donna Whitehead, our admin assistant these past five years, and welcomed our new office manager, Lynn Duick, this past week. In the midst of all of that, I had the opportunity for a three-month sabbatical for some much-needed rest and a chance to dive deeper into trauma studies, which was such a blessing to be able to do. And thank you to Joanne Schwarzenschuber for her work coming in with the youth during that time. One of the highlights from my sabbatical was volunteering at uh, Hidden Acres Single, Single Moms Camp, which I've been invited back to this summer as well and greatly looking forward to that. In the midst of all of these transitions this past year, it has continued to be a joy to be a part of such a thriving congregation. Fall started with a bang, with ministries ramping up to above COVID participation. MYF increased the frequency of events with a, with a desire for more Bible studies and faith conversations. Junior youth programming continues to welcome new kids each week from, or each time from the community. Our kids' Sunday school is living into our in-house curriculum. Small groups have been meeting again and adult ed has been wrestling with challenging conversations and peaceful practices in helpful ways. The MDS trip last summer continues to be a significant milestone for those who attended. There has been such a thirst, not only to be together, but to be exploring faith together, which has been a significant marker of this past year, to the point that I can barely keep up. What a delightful problem to have. The enthusiasm around our all church Bible quizzing coming up in a few weeks is a great example of that joy and the eagerness that is alive in our congregation this year. Not to mention pickleball or today's pie auction. There's also great energy that comes from being an intergenerational church. Building relationships throughout all ages is something that this congregation has always done well at. In the past few years, this has been an intentional growth area for us. What an absolute gift it has been and continues to be. We have so many great things to celebrate and to be grateful for, and I am truly delighted to be a pastor in this congregation to see where God is leading us in the coming days, weeks, and years. Our worship theme last fall was Voices Together. And while the impetus for this worship series was exploring our new hymnal, it seems to me that we as a congregation embodied living as Voices Together as we walk through this year of transition in 2023. We experienced a variety of seasons, a season of goodbye to Wendy Wagler and Steve Drudge and 
the sabbatical rest for Pastor Sarah, a season of hello to the pastor of witness and resourcing, Ben Castles, and to interim financial accountant, Ashley Drudge, a season of meetings, there were hundreds of them, <laughs> to prayerfully discern how best to say goodbye and hello and live into this new chapter of life at SMC. I named that I enjoy meetings, most of them, which means it was a great year for me. I find that meetings provide uh, another way to learn to know people in the congregation. Meetings help me understand this congregation's rich history and how it functions. And meetings offer another way to experience the Spirit of God at work in our midst. It was a season of gatherings around food. From June through September of last year, there were six potlucks two farewell potlucks and an afternoon tea for Stephen Linnell Drudge, a reception for Wendy Wagler, a finger food potluck for the Chin congregation who gave leadership to a Sunday worship service, a potluck at Hidden Acres for church camping weekend, and a potluck meal and barbecue when Pastor Ben arrived. We do food well in this church. It was a season of formation as a pastoral team as Sarah and Ben and I weekly meet to read the text for the upcoming worship service and pray together, check our schedules and discuss our various varied areas of ministry, we continue to learn more about our individual strengths and preferences and working styles. We laugh together a fair bit and we're forming a strong sense of team. To add to the seasons from a personal perspective, 2023 was a season of firsts for me. Even though I'm in my second year here as pastor of worship and care, it was a first in-person Christmas Eve service. You may recall we had to cancel Christmas Eve service in 2022 because of the ice storm. It was the first year that I could leave my home and arrive three minutes later to the new Hamburg fairgrounds for the relief sale. That was lovely. It was a first to meet with three other local Mennonite leaders for a four-week Bible study for the new Anabaptist Community Bible. This Bible will be forthcoming in early 2025 to mark the 500th anniversary of the beginning of Anabaptism. It was also a season of seconds. In addition to my role as pastor, I began my second term serving on the Comer Grable University College Board. This role includes multiple evening meetings sprinkled throughout the year. And as a Grable alum, it's a great way to keep up with happenings and trends there. It was also the second year that I've sung with the Inshallah Choir in Waterloo. Inshallah is a group of about 70 singers who gather Tuesday late afternoons to sing songs and prayers for peace. It's an ecumenical and interfaith group. However, there's a large sprinkling of Mennonites in the mix. And as it happens, our spring concert is this very afternoon at 3 o'clock at the Knox Presbyterian Church in Waterloo. It's free admission with an offering for a water project. So if you need a place to help settle your pie after the auction, the concert will be an inspiration. There have been so many seasons in 2023. And as pastor of worship and care, I have witnessed God's spirit at work in many expressions of care offered within the congregation and the community. I have observed the relational care extended on a Sunday morning in conversations before and after worship. I have heard of kindness shared in small ways and large ways. Thank you for the support and the encouragement that you have shared with me and the rest of the pastoral team. We as a congregation are voices together, for that's what the church is, a mosaic of voices centered around our faith in Jesus Christ. And sometimes we're in harmony with one another. Sometimes we're a unison voice. Sometimes we're out of tune, but we are still voices together, and may this continue in the coming year.
Well, that's too big. When it comes to singing, I am definitely one of the voices out of tune. <laughs> well, as the new guy, I guess, I thought I would take this opportunity to reflect a little bit on what the last uh, almost eight months has been a bit like for me joining Steinman's here. When you're a new pastor somewhere, it's common for others outside the church to ask you, so, how's it going? And without any forethought to make sure my messaging is always the same, I have actually found that fairly consistently I am responding basically the same way when someone asks me that question. I say something like, I am having so much fun. And it's true, I am. Now, fun is perhaps not a word that a pastor's report will usually hang upon, but as I look back over the sweep of my short time here so far, the emotion that bubbles to the surface is joy and fun. But when I talk about fun, I don't only mean the laughter that happens within the staff team when we're all together, as sometimes we are going into each other's office to share something funny, or we're shouting between our offices, which is sometimes funny, or when Sarah's right beside me and she decides to call me on the phone for some reason because we're both too lazy to stand up. Um, I don't only mean the fun and the laughter that happens on Sunday mornings in conversation together in the hall or in the last few weeks as we've been looking at old photo directories. That's been a lot of fun to laugh about together. Although that's all certainly part of what has been fun. I'm also talking about the joy and fun it has been to be welcomed here so well. And the warmth and joy that has been extended to me as the new person with words of appreciation and acts of care. And especially in the last while when my family's had some health challenges. Thank you. It has been fun as a parent to see my children slide into life here at Steinman's and all that being a kid and a youth in this place means. As a family, we have been yearning for this kind of experience of faith and church for our kids, and it has been fun to watch and to see it happen. It's also been fun getting to be a pastor in your midst. In being a pastor and who this church is at this moment and be finding who I am in the midst of who we are, how I fit, how, how my role and giftings encourages and works within team and who we are as a congregation. It's been fun and such a joy uh, being in a place that when I come up with a uh, silly idea for worship, like making you all search for coins and then getting to trade them for slap bracelets, that this is embraced with over-the-top enthusiasm beyond which I was expecting. Getting to be creative together as a pastoral team is one of the joys and what is so much fun. It's been fun and a joy to be in a church that has such a strong identity and passion around witness, living our faith out loud, and out there beyond these walls, and doing this in such a wide variety of ways. And it's been fun and a joy to see how so much of this just comes from our own passions and places of deep faith, like on the Peace and Justice Committee, or the Breakfast Club, or at Maker's Market, or the Peace Breakfast. It's been fun to get to hear the dreams on the witness front as well and to partner with many of you in wondering what's possible, like around the community garden or an expanded role at the relief sale, which you can read about in your bulletins this week, or conversations around what it means to be welcoming or to be working at reconciliation with Indigenous neighbours. All things that are happening within the big umbrella that we call witness. It's been fun and a joy to be part of this church that is so generous with its resources and to be a part of that. With how this building is used and shared with many and maintained with an eye towards that end goal. With seeing the cemetery expansion, with the kitchen folks that make so much of our life together possible, with how we think about our finances and our giving as not just paying our bills, but as an extension of our shared community life together. And it's been fun and a joy to begin to live into one of the portions of the shared lead pastor role that falls in my portfolio, which has to do with visioning. 
visioning towards the future and strategic planning, and in particular working with the VFT on this front, some of which you'll hear about later in the meeting afterwards. These are just some of the reasons why when people ask me in this first year, how is it going, I find myself repeatedly saying, I am having so much fun because it is a joy to be part of you, to worship God together, and to worship and to together be following in the ways of Jesus as we seek to love God and live differently. And here at the end of my report, I'm realizing I should have come up with something fun for us to do, and I didn't, so we're done. <laughs> a lot. That's really great to hear. Thank you guys for preparing that. We're going to move uh, into our time of congregational prayer. I don't know how to transition to this, but our hearts are aching right now. Um, for John and Helmy Weeb, as they mourn the sudden passing of their beloved son, Samuel, um, a memorial service is going to be planned for a later date. And at this time, John and Helmy welcome our prayer support and our emails and cards. We also want to remember Harry Martin, and he's moving to Parkwood Seniors Community in Waterloo this week. And Harry, I can't see you here, I don't know if you're here. There he is, he's right there, hi Harry. Um, may God bless you as you transition and begin forming new relationships and new routines in that community. Are there any other ways that you would like us to pray with and for you today? Okay. Let's pray together then. God, we bring these prayers before you along with many others that we have not spoken today. We particularly ask that you surround John and Helmy along with their entire family as they mourn the loss of Samuel. We lament the pain and struggle that he faced through these last many years. God, keep his parents and siblings, his friends and community in your arms. Hold them so close in your loving embrace. We pray for individuals who are struggling with mental and physical illnesses, with addictions, with the loss of hope. We pray for the families who are trying to offer their love and support. We just pray for your healing. We pray for those who are experiencing violence and hunger, loss of housing and security. We especially grieve with the families of the aid workers who were killed this week while feeding the starving men, women, and children in Gaza. Lord, have mercy. Turn the hearts of those in power to seek an end to conflict and bloodshed. We pray for food, shelter, and safety for those whose homes and livelihoods have been destroyed. We pray for the return of hostages and for lasting peace to somehow find its way in. God, we thank you for the abundance that we experience here, especially in our congregation, for the talents and treasure and time that people so freely offer and give. We offer you our gratitude for the past year, and we pray that you will give us your discerning spirit's guidance as we make plans for the future. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. We're now going to move into our time of offering, and so I'm going to ask uh, that the ushers will collect the offerings and then come forward for a blessing after that. The slide up on the screen shows the various ways that you can give. Our special offerings for this month go to House of Friendship.
Please pray with me. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with good gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. We receive these gifts in gratitude and offer them to the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you. If anyone was missed by the ushers, you can just uh, deposit your offering on the way out today. Um, for announcements this week, I'm going to encourage everyone to read their bulletins very well um, and check out your weekly emails for events in the life of the congregation. Our annual general meeting will be starting shortly, um, both here in person and online via Zoom. Um, there will be a potluck after that and a pie auction after that. We're going to keep telling you guys um, what's going to happen next as we go. Not that we're making it up as we go along, definitely not doing that, um, but uh, yeah. first verse of number 813, Heart with Loving Heart United, the first verse. Please stand. now go forth in peace and be of good courage hold fast to that which is good rejoicing in the power of the holy spirit and may the god who fills the hungry with good things fill us all with christ-like love and with a consuming hunger for justice in our land and in our world amen